All right, as usual, I've fallen a little bit behind and didn't quite get through all the material I needed to this semester. We have two topics left to cover, which I'm gonna do in this supplemental video. Um, last class, we talked about the Kuiper belt, which you can see in this image here, and also the Oort cloud beyond it. We still have to talk about the asteroid belt and asteroids in general. So let's start with that. So you can see in this picture, most of them are located between Mars and Jupiter in a band, but they also have other locations as you'll see. The largest asteroids in the asteroid belt, largest asteroids period, are Ceres and Vesta. Here you see Hubble Space Telescope pictures of them from before we visited them. This was about as good as you could image them at the time. Then we visited both of these with the Dawn spacecraft back in the early 2010s. In 2011, the Dawn spacecraft went into orbit around Vesta, and you see it here. It's a little bumpy and lumpy. It's, it's not big enough to be a dwarf planet. Ceres, of course, is a dwarf planet, uh, but this one, it wasn't able to pull itself into a spherical enough shape. It's not massive enough. Uh, but it is the second largest, second most massive asteroid out there. And here we have Ceres, after orbiting Vesta for a while, Dawn fired its thrusters and went over to Ceres and went in orbit around it. It, you can see, is larger, uh, was able to pull itself into a roughly uh, spherical or at least smooth uh, shape. You see the bright spots there in that crater, and it's believed these are salt deposits, some some water deposits kind of vaporized, leaving this salty residue behind. Here are the top 10 biggest asteroids uh, compared to the, the moon. This right here represents Earth's moon. So these are all very small worlds, much smaller than our moon. The Ves or, um, Ceres, of course, uh, does qualify to be a dwarf planet. Here's some regular asteroids. When the Galileo spacecraft uh, went to Jupiter back in the 1990s, they programmed its flight path to have a few close encounters with asteroids. Flying through the asteroid belt is not like the movie Empire Strikes Back when they're flying through and dodging asteroids. If you just take a random path through the asteroid belt, you'll see nothing. Uh, you really have to plan your path strategically to even come close enough to see one of these things. Uh, this one's Gaspra, uh, not very big. You see the scale there. The scale is about 10 kilometers, so maybe it's 20 kilometers long. Also passed by Ida, and uh, this one had a surprise for us. It had a moon. Turns out this is a pretty common thing, asteroids uh, having moons or being binaries or triple or multiple systems. But this was the first that we saw that, Ida and its moon Dactyl. So uh, why do we have a belt of asteroids? Why don't we just have a planet there? If you look at the sequence of planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and so forth, you know them, uh, there's a certain spacing to them. And if you follow the pattern, you kind of expect a planet to be here between Mars and, and Jupiter. And the reason no planet ever formed is Jupiter keeps messing with it. You have a number of resonances uh, destructive resonances, uh, the primary one being a 2-1 destructive resonance. Similar to what we saw in the rings of Saturn, Mimas kept tugging on any particle that lands in the Cassini division and, and clears it out. And Jupiter's doing the same thing. At some part, you know, partway through the asteroid belt, at that distance from the sun, you go around the sun twice every time Jupiter goes around once. And so you get you know, you go around once and Jupiter's tugging on you. You go around another time and Jupiter's not there, but you come around again, Jupiter's tugging on you again in the same direction. Again, it's like pushing a swing. These aren't random tugs. They all line up in the same direction and you'll clear out a band. And so here you see distance from the sun and astronomical units and the distribution of asteroids. At this distance right here, you have the two one destructive resonance, and it's a destructive resonance because the more massive object, in this case Jupiter, is on the outside. 
In the case of the Cassini division, Mimas is the more massive object and it's on the outside and it's a destructive resonance. It clears out that area. But you see there are other resonances as well. These are all resonances with Jupiter. Here we have 3-1, here we have 4-1, here we have 5-2, 7-2. The larger uh, and, and stranger the mix of numbers, the, the weaker the resonance is. But if you have simple things like 2-1, 3-1, uh, even 5-2, uh, these can be pretty powerful resonances. These are, again, pushing the swing at just the right time to clear out these bands. With all of these destructive resonances, again, destructive because Jupiter's farther out, the more massive things farther out, it just prevented these from coalescing into a single planet. It's always pulling them apart. So we're just left with that main belt of asteroids. And, you know, we saw similar behavior in the rings of Saturn. This big dark area here is the Cassini division where this end of it's cleared out completely, but all of it's fairly empty. But we see all sorts of structure all throughout the rings. And these are other resonances other than 2-1 with Mimas and also with the other moons of Saturn. Okay, so that's the, the main belt, the main asteroid belt, but there are other places that you can have asteroids. Uh, this is a picture or a diagram of Jupiter going around the sun, and you can see it's Lagrange points. Each planet going around the sun, each moon going around a planet, they're Lagrange points, and these are gravitationally stable or semi-stable places where we can, you know, for Earth, if this was the sun and the Earth, then these Lagrange points are places where we often will put spacecraft so they can sit in a single location without expending too much or in some cases any fuel to sit there. Now of the five Lagrange points, two are completely stable. In other words, if you get in there, you're kind of stuck in there. You don't have to expend any fuel at all. In fact, you'd have to expend fuel to get out. And these are L4 and L5. They're 60 degrees ahead of and 60 degrees behind the planet. And Jupiter being the biggest planet, uh, these two locations are gravitational centers where th things can collect and asteroids in particular. And so you have clusters of asteroids there. This is just to remind me, I have a little animated GIF here. If asteroids get stuck in positions four or five, they stay there. And these are called Trojan asteroids. So here's the sun, here's Jupiter, here are the Western Trojan asteroids and the Eastern Trojan asteroids. And here's the main belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now you have other classes of asteroids. You have asteroids that swoop in, uh, in you know, from the main belt in towards the inner planets. If it crosses Mars orbit, we call that an AMOR, A-M-O-R, asteroid. And if it crosses Earth orbit, we call those Apollo asteroids. And those are, of course, interesting to us because uh, they stand the potential of maybe someday striking the Earth since they're crossing our orbit. So we're very careful about those. Uh, those asteroids that pass close to Earth or orbit close to Earth, we call those uh, near-Earth asteroids or near-Earth objects, NEOs. My telescopes in Chile, uh, we get a fair amount of funding from NASA to help determine the orbits of NEOs, of near-Earth objects, uh, just to make sure none of them are going to hit the Earth. You know, as they're discovered, we follow them up, discovered by other telescopes, but we follow them up and help determine the orbits. Now, let's see. This is a mission called Near-Earth Asteroid Rendezvous, or the NEAR mission, N-E-A-R. And went to a number of these NEOs, these near-Earth objects, near-Earth asteroids. The last one it went to was Eros. And uh, here's a picture of it. And uh, I have a video here of it orbiting around Eros that's kind of fun to watch. I'll pull that up. And once the picture kicks in, I'll start it over. Well, it'll start over if it wants to, I guess. There we go. And so you can see it in orbit around the asteroid. A couple of orbits there. 
And Eros was the last asteroid that it visited. It hit a number of these, and then it was the end of the mission. The funding, funding ran out, so it decided to land on Eros, even though it was never really designed to land. They set it down as gently as they could. Here's the last picture. I think I showed this back in lesson five, the last picture it took as it was settling down. You can see where the uh, transmission was cut off because it lost that cap capability upon landing. <coughs> but interestingly, it did survive the landing. It's, it's a crash landing because it was never designed to, but they did it slowly enough that uh, it did survive and they continued to do experiments on the surface for a couple of weeks, which is kind of cool. Now, some asteroids don't just approach Earth you know, closely, but actually um, encounter the Earth, strike it, enter our, our atmosphere. So here's one. And this is actually shot during the day. You can see it's passing across the sun there. This is an asteroid that broke apart. Here's a zoom in. You can see it breaking apart in the atmosphere. Our atmosphere protects us at least from the smaller ones of these. This one was big enough that part of it didn't burn up in the atmosphere. Part of it made it all the way down to the ground uh, and it actually landed in New York City and struck a car. You can see the, I have a separate picture of the damage here. I always thought it'd be interesting calling up your insurance company and trying to explain this one being hit by an asteroid, but uh, <laughs> hopefully their insurance covered it. Now that, that's kind of a small impact. Actually, you know, I've always wanted my car to be struck by an asteroid because uh, these asteroids are incredibly valuable, far more valuable than my car or pretty much any car. So if your car is struck by an asteroid and you get to keep the asteroid, that, that's good. Good for you. Now I wouldn't want to be struck by one this big, but we've uncovered, now here you see one being uncovered in the desert, another one in a museum. We've uncovered some pretty big ones. And they must have started out much bigger and, and, and a lot of it got burnt up in the atmosphere, but there's enough to make it down to the ground. And it's not just asteroids that hit us. Uh, I'm talking about asteroids now, but also comets, of course. We talked about the Oort cloud previously and they swoop into the solar system on these very eccentric orbits. And um, you know, sometimes they'll hit the earth. And, and as we talked about before, this is how a lot of our water got here initially. Uh, these kinds of objects hitting us. The asteroids are more rocky and metallic, and comets, of course, are more of water, sometimes with ammonia, methane, and stuff mixed in. So here's, it's kind of a busy plot, but it's an interesting plot. This shows what makes it to the ground and how devastating it is and how frequently these kinds of uh, interactions occur. So on the Horizontal axis here, we have megatons of TNT equivalent. Let me see, just to calibrate your scale, 10 megatons, this line right here, that is kind of like a modern day hydrogen bomb, a fusion bomb. And that's the boundary between what burns up and what doesn't. So anything less powerful than an H-bomb burns up in our atmosphere and never makes it to the ground. Anything more powerful can make it to the ground. Here you see, um, where the, the first nuclear bomb, a fission bomb the, that we dropped on Hiroshima, it clocks in at 20 kilotons, not megatons, kilotons. And events like that happen every few years. And you may say, wait, wouldn't we, noticed, wouldn't, wouldn't we notice if there are these nuclear explosions going off in the sky every couple of years? And no, you only notice if it makes it to the ground and deposits all that energy at once. Again, anything to the left of this line, it burns up in the atmosphere, so it's, it's not like all that energy is released in the form of an explosion. But you get down to H-bomb levels, and you know we're talking about once in a thousand years, something will get through and have an H-bomb kind of effect. And the last one uh, was Tunguska, which is a place in Siberia, and it came down in 1908. And it actually broke up right above the surface. It did not impact, but the shock wave leveled in an area the size of Siberia. They felt it all the way across Europe. So, uh, and, and that didn't even hit 
it didn't even hit the ground. So these things can be very, very powerful. Here's another example. This is much, much older. This is Meteor Crater in Arizona. If you're ever driving across Arizona, you can stop here. It's uh, a tourist site or I can't remember if it's a uh, government owned or privately owned, but uh, you can stop there, pay a little bit of money and, and take a look at it. Uh, but this was a, you know, much longer ago, but this would have been a pretty big impact to create a crater like this. And the biggest impacts you know, up here, we're hitting the global catastrophe threshold. Stuff above here will have a significant impact on the environment, on life, and the best known example of that is the extinction of the dinosaurs, which clocks in way up here at well over 10 million megatons of TNT equivalent. Fortunately, that happens very, very rarely, uh, millions of years between such events. The one that wiped out the dinosaurs, um, it struck in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, we've since figured that out, uh, people drilling for oil you know, kind of figured out the, the terrain under the water there, and that's where we think it hit. And this is, of course, just an artist rendition, but it, it's designed to get the, the uh, magnitude of the explosion approximately correct. It would have thrown material way up, and not just into the atmosphere, but above the atmosphere, and it would have come back down, raining all this debris that would have gotten mixed all within the atmosphere and spread throughout the Earth, and, you know, one of the big lines of evidence that this actually did happen, other than, you know, all the dinosaurs, not all, but uh, particularly the large dinosaurs, most of the dinosaurs went extinct all of a sudden, is in the geological record. If you dig down through the rocks, the deeper you go corresponds to farther back in time as the material was laid down. And there's a layer there with, I think it's 10 times as much iridium as we find anywhere else. It's covering the entire planet. And, but it's typical of the iridium that you have in these asteroids. So kind of a rare element and it, we have the impact, it got mixed in with the debris carried all over the surface of the earth and settled into this geological layer. But, um, you know, the rest of it would have circulated in the atmosphere and created nuclear winter conditions. You know, the sun would have been blocked out for years, maybe uh, even a decade or longer. And that, of course, affects life on Earth tremendously. And these things happen periodically. We've had a number of mass extinctions, not just the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, but mass extinctions uh, going back in time long before that, that are well documented. And probably not all, but most of those were probably caused by these kinds of impacts. All right, so that's asteroids. Uh, the final topic, I'd ask if there are any questions, but I'm just shooting this myself. Um, the final topic is exoplanets. So we've talked about our solar system in tremendous detail, but uh, it's not the only, so, only system out there, of course. There are many, many stars, hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy alone. And we think most of them have planetary systems now. So there's a lot out there. Now, when I was an undergrad, the only plants we really knew about were the ones in our solar system. All of this has been discovered since then. And we've discovered these other planets through a variety of techniques. And I'm going to emphasize four techniques, two of them in particular. There are two techniques that we've used to discover most of these extrasolar planets or exoplanets for short. But I'll list kind of the, the top four and show you a few slides about each. So the first one uh, makes use of the Doppler technique. Let's see if I have this up. I'll just uh, load it here. The Doppler technique. So planets around other stars, they're not emitting their own light. Uh, they're reflecting light from their star. The star is so much brighter that it makes it really hard to directly see the planets. There are a few cases where we've directly seen planets, and I'll, I'll come to that last. But most of the time, we can't see the planets. We have to infer their existence, indirect methods of detection. And the first of these is the Doppler technique. 
So this figure is not to scale. This is meant to be the sun and Jupiter. Of course, Jupiter is much, much farther away. But you see that um, it's not just Jupiter orbiting the sun. They're both orbiting a common center of mass. Just like the Earth-Moon system, they, you know, we orbit a center of mass that's inside the Earth. Uh, the Sun-Jupiter system orbits a center of mass that's kind of right near the solar surface. So if I put my mouse right here, you see the Sun's kind of dancing around that point there. Now, if you're far away, you don't see Jupiter, you see the Sun. You know, if you're in some other star system looking at us, and sometimes you'll see the Sun inching towards you, and sometimes you'll see it inching away, and that will have a Doppler effect. So here, when Jupiter is going this way, the sun's going that way, and so the light will be blue shifted. If you took a spectrum of the sun and looked at its uh, lines, its absorption, absorption lines, you'd see them being blue shifted. And here, when Jupiter is coming towards you, the observer, and the sun's moving away, the lines would be red shifted. Of course, we don't see this, you know, we're not in another solar system looking back at ours, but we can look out at all these other stellar systems, solar systems, stellar systems and look at these stars and take spectra of them and see if they're being red shifted and blue shifted. Now it's a small effect, right? Uh, uh, unless the, the planet's really close or really massive, it's gonna be a small effect. And it was too small for us to detect before the 90s. But the first star uh, that uh, this was pulled off with was 51 PEG. And what you're looking at here is the radial velocity measured from the Doppler effect, which we talked about back in lesson three. You see the radial velocity uh, over time. So it goes up and it comes down. And then this is the same data repeated twice. That's why you see the same scatter. It's kind of traditional with these plots where it's periodic that you show uh, two cycles of it. You just plot the data and plot it again. Anyway, uh, here's you know, where the star is moving away. And here's where the star is moving towards us, about 50 meters per second. And this was a surprise. It wasn't really expected that we would detect it. Uh, for a planet like Jupiter, at a distance of Jupiter, the tugging on the star is much, much less. So this was a rather interesting system. Now, first thing you can see is the period is really short. It's only about four days. So this is a world that's going around its star every four days. And you can use Kepler's third law and uh, at least Newton's form of it. Suppose we know the mass of the star, but we can then figure out how far this planet is from its period uh, using Newton's third or Kepler's third, Newton's form of it. And this planet is only 0 0.05 AU from the sun. Mercury is at about 0.4 AU. So this is like eight times closer to its sun, its star, than Mercury is to our sun and going around every four days. So this is a planet that's in really, really close. And then you can figure out how massive it is by looking at these velocities. How massive does it have to be at that distance to tug the star this much? And the, this planet uh, clocked in at about half of a Jupiter mass. You know, very unexpected, right? And Jupiter mass planets form in the outer solar system. We never expected any to be in an, the inner part of a solar system. And particularly this close, it's right up against the star and going around every four days. It'd be tightly locked and all sorts of stuff. So it's a surprise. Uh, here's another system. You can see data for this taken in the 90s and the wobbles are more complex and that's because we're looking at not a single planet going around, but three of them. Each of them tugs on it in different ways at different times. And so you see there's a fast oscillation, a slower one, and then an even slower one kind of shown here in blue. And if you map it out, you have one. So here's our solar system for scale, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And then here are these three planets superimposed just to give you a sense of the scale. One is also, again, super close. You have one out here kind of between um, Venus and Earth distances and then another one. These happen to have somewhat eccentric orbits. This one out beyond Mar you know, the distance to Mars. They're all tugging on it. 
And here are the first 50 discovered by this technique. Oh, and I forgot to say with this here, with these three worlds, their masses are 0.7, 2.1, and 4.3 Jupiters. So all three of these are gas giants, but very close to their star. Again, unexpected. And here are the first 50 or so discovered, and there's Earth's orbit for scale. And they're all, again, Jovian mass planets. So very unlike our solar system, these are gas giants super close to their star. And that's why we could discover them back in the 90s when our technology wasn't so good. Because if you have something that massive that close, you can really tug on a star and give it a Doppler shift that we could detect with that technology. Let's see what's next. Yeah, so here's just an artist rendering what these worlds would look like, particularly ones that are really close, like that one around 51 peg or the first one of those last three that I showed you, a gas giant, maybe more massive than Jupiter sometimes in very close proximity, very hot, it would be tidally locked. And it's something that should not form. If you think back about what we talked about in the last class, to form a gas giant, you need to be pretty far away. It has to be cold enough that you can accrete water and, and water ammonia and maybe even water ammonia methane to build up a planetesimal with enough mass that it hits that critical mass and you have runaway accretion to get a gas giant. Close to the star, it's too hot. You can accrete metals and rocks, but there's not much of them. You'll never hit critical mass and start pulling in hydrogen and helium from the nebula. So uh, it's a big question. How did these hot, we call them hot Jupiters, how did they get there? They could not have formed there. They had to form far away and then somehow migrate in. Now we've seen a little bit about planet migration in our solar system. We talked about this last time. You know, in the early solar system, we formed these four gas giants where you hit critical mass and pulled in the hydrogen and helium. But there would have been a bunch of worlds, objects that did not hit critical mass, the planetesimals. And we talked about how the gas giants cleared them out. It pushed some of them out into the Kuiper belt and Jupiter and Saturn pushed some all the way out into the Oort cloud and a lot ended pushed inwards towards the sun. And most of them actually went inwards towards the sun. And after pushing all these primarily inwards, the planets recoiled and moved outwards uh, just a little bit. So there's already, um, so, you know, we already know a little bit about planets changing their position through these interactions. So what we think happened with these hot Jupiters is you have a gas giant there and it's not just clearing out little planetesimals, essentially comets and things of that size, but maybe you have an, a planet to planet encounter. Suppose two really massive worlds have a close encounter. Um, you know, maybe sometimes they hit, but sometimes they don't. They whip around each other. One gets thrown out, outwards and maybe even out of the solar system. We found evidence for what we call rogue planets, planets that were ejected and they're just floating through space, cold, you know, without a star, just floating throughout the uh, galaxy. Lots of rogue planets out there. But one gets thrown out and the other gets thrown in. It migrates, not slowly, but quickly down towards the center. And you can imagine what's gonna happen uh, to all the, you know, suppose there are terrestrial worlds forming closer to this protosun, Earth-like worlds. If that gas giant starts walking into the inner solar system and, and ends up super close to its star, uh, you know, well within Mercury's orbit, all the, any terrestrial planets that were forming would just get chucked out. So we don't really expect there to be Earth-like or terrestrial planets in these systems with the hot Jupiters. Though, you know, these Jovian planets, they have moons and those moons have now been pulled into the inner solar system. So they may be just perfect uh, for, for life. The moons of these gas giants. Anyway, so in some systems we have small variations and in some systems you have uh, big variations. Now, as we talked about last time, you only have so much time to accrete your, your plants for the solar system to form here. 
And so let me back up a second here. So what happens when you chuck the world in, it's then moving through all the gas uh, in the inner part of the disk. And that's a source of friction that will eventually circularize the orbit. You know, it, it had been moving around here, clearing out its orbit around the sun, but now it's on this different path, crossing across all this material. And it's going to be a, a source of drag, a source of friction. And eventually, it will settle down into a, a circular orbit. But there's only so much time for that to happen. Again, once the protostar turns on and becomes a sun, it's going to blow out all the gas. And, and that gas is what would circularize the orbit. Again, here are the first 50 or so discovered. And indeed, many of them are in these circular orbits close into the star. But you see, many are eccentric. And so these are worlds that were working their way in, uh, but the star turned on, blew out the gas, and so there was no friction there for it anymore. So it just stayed in its elliptical orbit. So again, evidence of migration that many of these are, are fairly eccentric. Though some are circular, meaning that they kind of settled in uh, before the star turned on and evacuated all the gas. So um, how often do we have each of these? Now here's the case where you had a, a big interaction and you're tossing a, a gas giant in from the outer parts into the inner parts to form a hot Jupiter. You know, initially all the ones we were finding were hot Jupiters, but that's because they're so easy to detect. Again, a massive object that close, you have a huge Doppler effect. But it turns out not, that doesn't mean most of the systems are that way. Most of the ones we discovered early on were that way because those were the easiest to discover. But now we've been looking for a much longer time and with more sensitive equipment, we can discover Jupiter mass planets at Jupiter distances. The Doppler tug is less, but our technology can now measure it. Of course, these worlds take many years to orbit the sun, so we've had to watch for many years to pick them out. But enough time has gone on that we've discovered a lot of these. And we can now say that the hot Jupiters, it's only about 10% of systems. 90% of systems are like our own, where, yeah, the gas giants may move around a little bit, but not a tremendous amount giving us systems kind of like our own. OK, so that's the primary technique, the Doppler effect. Uh, the big technique, or that it's the, it was the primary technique. It's one of the big two. Nowadays, the big technique is the transit effect. And so if you have a world passing in front of a star, it will block its light and make the star a little bit dimmer. Now, this only works if the system is edge on from you know, us viewing it. If it's like this, the plants are going around the star and they're not passing in front of it. So it has to be edge on and you know, only a small fraction of systems will have that orientation with respect to us. But those that do, when the planet passes in front, it dims. And not a lot, even if you have like a Jovian sized planet crossing in front, it may only dim the light 1%. But fortunately, we can measure the brightness of stars very accurately. So a 1% dim, dimming can be picked up. And, and even smaller worlds, as they transit, they cover less of the star, so it's less of a dimming, but uh, we have the ability to pick up some of those as well. So the most famous mission so far for this is the Kepler mission. Here you see it in its clean room being prepared. And this mission is, you know, run its course now. We put it up in space and it stared, this is kind of a zoom out of our Milky Way galaxy. We live, well, right here inside what's called the Orion Spur. And Kepler just stared down this arm of the galaxy. So it was looking at an over density of stars because if you're staring down the arm, it's star upon star upon star. It was looking at a whole bunch of stars and a good fraction of those were edge on. And they found, and Kepler, the spacecraft mission, found tons and tons of planets. And here's just kind of a poster that you can get. And a lot of them are, are big worlds, gas giants, but also a lot of smaller ones. And a few Earth mass planets. It wasn't really perfectly designed to discover Earths, but they're, they picked up a few in that category. So a very successful mission. The mission that's up there right now is called TESS. And it has a, a 
kind of a different game plan. Instead of staring in one spot of the sky for a long period of time, it will cover large chunks of the sky. So it's not going for depth in a single certain area, but breadth. It's going to cover the entire sky. And so really you're focusing on the kind of the, the closer, brighter stars. Uh, the stars that we, you know, eventually someday we will be traveling amongst the stars going out to these other places. And uh, this may well be the mission that discovers some of the first Earth-like planets that we visit. So it will tile the whole sky. And it's similar to an experiment we have at UNC that I mentioned back when we were talking about telescopes. This is the every scope. There's one down at my site in Chile, the prompt site. And there's another one up in the Northern Hemisphere in California. And it's a whole bunch of little cameras that all together image the entire sky. In this case, the Southern sky, the one in the North, the Northern sky. And so they're also watching the whole sky, watching the brightest stars, trying to pick out planets around it. This is more of a kind of a pathfinder. The next every scope is being designed now. It's gonna be a much larger system, in this case in the Northern hemisphere. Each of these little dots will be, I believe an eight inch telescope. And there are 650 of them. So this is gonna be quite a unique telescope and uh, the National Science Foundation has um, uh, given us a grant, Nick Law, Professor Nick Law at UNC, to start the design work. The whole thing will be about $10 million. So there's more money to raise before uh, it comes to building stage, but it's in the works. Okay, those are the two big techniques. I wanna mention just um, two more techniques though. One, and this is really interesting, it's kind of a teaser for Astro 102 material. One is gravitational lensing. So this is something Einstein predicted that light, even though light has no mass, he says it will be deflected in a gravitational field by a certain amount. And this was tested in 1919 during an eclipse of the sun. So the idea is, you know, here's earth, here's the sun, the moon blocks out the sun so we can actually take pictures of the stars. And the idea is, here's a star that's technically behind the sun. We can't see it because the sun is blocking that star and the moon is blocking the sun, but it's emitting light in all directions. Some of it will glance right over the surface of the sun and be redirected if Einstein's right towards us. And so we'll see it over here off on the edge of the sun, even though it's really behind the sun, we'll see it displaced by almost two arc seconds. And that's exactly what we saw. So a pretty impressive prediction then verified. And we've been making use of it ever since. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of examples of gravitational lensing. Let's see what's next here. So this, is, this looks like a really old picture, but uh, what happens if here's Earth and we're looking off towards some star, again, not to scale, but watching some star and its brightness is constant. But what if another system passes between us? Well, that star's light can be again, gravitationally deflected and oriented at us. So if this other star passes in front, suppose it's a dim star, uh, we can barely see it compared to the brightness of this star. This star will grow brighter. It's like a, a lens, it's a gravitational lens taking not just the light that's coming at us directly, but all the light crossing through the circle gets redirected at us and it brightens. And we see lots of examples of that. This is a star that's always this brightness, but something passed in front of it another star and brightened it. And then it passed on and dims back down to its normal level. But what if not just the star gets between us, but once the star moves on, maybe it has a planet and that planet can get between us and the background star and it will act as a gravitational lens, not as powerful, but you see this little blip here. So this is a star and a planet that passed in front of a background star lensing it, gravitationally lensing it. So this is called gravitational micro lensing. And planets can be discovered this way as well. And um, these are kind of one-shot deals. Everything has to line up just right. And as the one system keeps moving on, it'll never line up with that background star again. So, you know, we can find these things and say, hey, there's a world there around that star, but we'll never be able to go and uh, follow it up, not with this technique, maybe with some of the other techniques. 
In fact, uh, there was a report of one of these microlensing events, uh, planetary microlensing events in Andromeda, a completely different galaxy than our own. We've discovered thousands and thousands of planets in our own galaxy through all these techniques, but through microlensing, uh, we can possibly discover them in other galaxies completely. But again, they're one-shot deals. We can't then follow it up. And then the last technique, and this is direct imaging, actually taking a picture of a planet, which is really hard to do because they're very close to these super bright stars. The star overwhelms uh, the image. But there have been techniques developed where we'll take pictures at two different times and subtract them, trying to cancel out the star. And so since the planet moves, it's still in uh, the image. You can like subtract them. And so it'll be, you'll have a positive of the planet in one place and a negative of the planet in another place. But anyway, uh, here's, and we looked at this before, this is the Beta Pictoris system. I think this is the first instance of direct imaging. And we see this Jupiter-like planet uh, out here. And the last thing I have for this video, pull it up here. Uh, this is a movie. This is another system. It's called HR 8799. It doesn't have a fancy name, but uh, there are four planets. Uh, I think one is five Jupiter masses and the other three are about seven Jupiter masses. And you can see them here. And it's through this kind of difference imaging where you can block out the star and that enables you to see the planets. And here you can actually see them more uh, moving, orbiting around the central star. But again, this is really rare, probably only a couple dozen planets at this point in time. Um, the last time I shot this video, uh, there are only a handful. So as this video gets older, um, that number will be out of date and there'll be more and more of these. Okay, that's it.